And go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Total Justice Gaming. I am Edward, a.k.a. the DJ Clax Hero, as always, with my buddy Joe, a.k.a. Ryder Kick. And today is a very special episode. We have a very, very special guest from the UFS community. Matthew Turner has decided to join us today. Matthew, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Ed. All right, and uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with UFS and uh, all that good stuff. Cool. Well, um, most of the people in the UFS community uh, know me as Piglet. Um, I, uh, I've been called Piglet ever since I was 12 years old. It was a name given to me by the UFS community, so uh, I wear it with pride. Um, I've played UFS ever since set one. Um, I started when I was 12, 12 or 13 years old, and now I'm 20. So I played through three companies, through... You know, I don't even know how many sets, 15 or so sets, and I've been in the game a long time. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I took a break from UFS in 2009 and a little bit of 2010 and came back, and I traveled to my first event because I was very young. I didn't travel the UFS events, but I really would have liked to. Um, in 2011, I traveled to my very first Gen Con, and at Gen Con, the World Championships, uh, I was crowned Extended World Champion. Um, I won the Extended format with um, a Hugo deck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh Since my, uh, my championship, um, I have, you know, top eights at different uh, local events. I know Joe and I. Um, have hosted uh, southeastern um, regionals and things like that, and I've yep. topped I've topped all of those events that I've been in. Uh, I was a top I was in top sixteen um, of worlds this past year playing Malian, and uh, also in two thousand eleven um, I was uh, in teams as a runner up, and uh, we actually ended up losing to our teammates. It was an ATL versus ATL teams final. And, uh, so that was, that was, you know, bittersweet. We were, I was happy for my teammates, but we did lose the, the world championships. So it was rough, but I was definitely happy. Uh, we, it, it was a, it was a kumbaya moment because before the match, we, we knew that, you know, ATL was getting a team's card one way or another, and we were all really excited about it. And, um, ATL now has, uh, unfortunately, it's slowed down in the UFS world. Um, a lot of the uh, older guys, uh, a lot of people know as Lion Stance, um, the, you know, the UFS godfathers of Atlanta, Drew Maffei, um, he, you know, works a full-time job as a teacher and uh, has a son. And um, Is he getting and, big, by the way? Uh, his son? Oh, yeah. Uh, it'll be his first birthday, uh, actually, Gen Con this year. My so, God. Wow. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, Drew won't be at Gym Con. He'll be celebrating, uh, his son's first birthday. And, uh, and then the other OGs, uh, David Wagner and, uh, Ben Shoemaker, they both work for, uh, Google, Google Incorporated. And, uh, uh, they, they love their job and they're busy with it. So we don't, um, not much UFS is played from them anymore, but, uh, what I like to call the young guns in Atlanta, uh, Alex Marco, uh, Keenan Meadows, myself. Which we will actually, sorry to interrupt, Matt, we, we oh. actually will be interviewing Keenan Meadows at a later time. Yeah, oh. and, uh, yeah, Keenan, Keenan is a great guy. Um, in my opinion, uh, probably the, the best player in the game today. If, I know that if oh. he could travel up to the more, I knew if he could travel up to, uh, to more events up north, like Canadian Nationals and stuff like that, then he would be, uh, he would be, you know, like, have a lot more cardboard, just to say the least. I mean, he was Swiss <laughs> champion. He was Swiss champion for this past Worlds and National Championship this year. And a lot of people call Garrett Brett the best player in UFS right now. But what a lot of people don't know is Keenan has never lost to Garrett. So, and right there, the shots have been fired. This is gonna, fired. This is going to be a fun interviewing session. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> And you know, it's hilarious because we keep telling Keenan he's horrible at this game. <laughs> so so I think, yeah, I think Garrett has played Keenan, I want to say twice, and uh, and he has never lost 
to Garrett. So, and I've actually never had the pleasure of playing Garrett. And actually, Garrett wanted to play me in extended, um, but I had ended up like my deck was just lost in the wind, pretty much. So I never got, um, I've never actually gotten a chance to play him. But I would love to play him. I've watched him play against many of my teammates, and he is a and he is a phenomenal player. Um, but Keenan is Keenan is he's he's world class player to say the least. Wow. To say. Uh, new segment of Total Justice Gaming, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, come to us for all your latest trash talk right here in Total Justice Gaming, 8 o'clock, 7 central. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, the, the, uh, I'm not really sure where we should go from here. I mean, you oh, gave well, us... Well, most simply, oh, um, <laughs> Matt, uh, what's some of your favorite decks you played, and... Uh, would you like to impart some of your deck building knowledge on some of the newer people that are coming out coming out to the game all of a sudden? Sure, sure, sure. I love. Um, I uh, I was talking earlier with the guys before the interview um, how much I love UFS content and uh, just like what I'm doing right now. I love to do it. I'm excited that Joe and Ed are uh, even giving me the opportunity to do this interview, giving the opportunity for people to see this interview. And I love it. I have no problem talking UFS. I love to talk UFS. Um, favorite decks? Um, uh, definitely my, uh, my extended Hugo deck. Um, it was, it was a very strong control deck that was able to loop out throws. And, um, that sounds familiar. I, I often, I often look to recreate that deck, um, in standard. And, uh, I'm actually in the process of doing that right now. Um, and I look, I take the strengths of the Hugo deck. Of course it, you know, the cards, the foundations are not as strong, uh, in today's game as they were in yesterday's game. But, um, I try to create a strong control deck that, um, that has the ability to um, get a lot of damage off of throws, um, and that's sort of uh, my play style. Um, I like to play. I like to play control decks uh-huh. that put people um, on on a clock. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, I played a lot of characters. Uh, King is one of my favorite decks. I played him off of Earth and Good. Um, I love. I, I I really enjoy throws. The the aspect of throws. Um, I think are really, really strong. Um, having a card guarantee damage dealt is really strong in UFS. And when you have the ability to do that turn after turn, it puts your opponent on this clock where if I don't do something within, you know, five turns, six turns, I'm going to keep hitting, getting hit for, you know, three or four damage, you know, sometimes more, but he's just pushing this damage on me over and over and over, and I have to do something about it. And I play a foundation control, uh, a control foundation base, so when they try to push me back, I can punish them for overextending. Now, interestingly, that you mentioned throwing king, uh, I built Ed's first deck, and it was a king deck. Sure. It is throws king, and I love it. And, uh, Simply, well, mostly for the fact that King is one of the characters I play in Tekken because I went into UFS as a fighting game fan, not as a TCG fan. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, what characters do you like from Tekken? I was like, man, I like Steve, I like King. He's like, man, I can build you some great decks from those characters. And he's like, I can do this Steve deck or I can do this King Throws deck. I'm like, wait a minute, tell me more. And here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I mean, I, I love, I love King. Um, uh, a lot of my favorite symbols, um, I, I, I'm going to go on the contrast of that, actually. Um, I like playing those uh, those control decks with throws. On the other hand, in standard of 2011, um, I played Fire Cassandra, and um, I was actually playing King um, in, the, in the season, and I didn't feel like... He was he was a strong enough character at the time. Um, I, I, he actually ended up 
being a strong enough character, but I was playing him off of good instead of earth when earth was the stronger symbol. So I moved on to a seven hand size fire aggro deck. And um, a lot of people know me famous for playing uh, low hand size characters. I play a lot of five hand size decks, um, a lot of six handers. But I really enjoy um, if I am going to play um, not a five or six hand size character, I'll play a seven. But I really enjoy playing aggro when I play seven handers. And fire is by far my favorite aggro symbol. Lots of free damage pump, lots of free speed pump. Big attacks, stun, dragon lifter, for the money, love, love fire. So, uh, I, I have sort of two different, um, you know, play styles that go off the wall. Um, I would say I lead more to the control throw play style because that's what I had, you know, the big success in. But, um, I definitely find fire to be really enjoyable. Excellent. And, yes. you know, that, that sounds like some good reasoning to me. Um, okay, just as a side note real quick, Joe, did you see the chat? Uh, let me look at the chat. Okay. Oh, okay. No, no, you guys keep talking. Um, oh, okay. Well, well, Edward, anything else you need to ask me? Well, um, off the top of my head, not a ton. I mean, I'm still, like, honestly fairly new to USS. I mean, I played it for a good year back in the day. I was running a Chun-Li Kicks deck. Not mm-hmm. the busted Chun Li that got bro- that got banned. The uh, not busted Chun Li that came in the starter deck. Sure, sure, and sure. I was running her because I bought a you know a random set of UFS off of eBay for like ten bucks. They sent me a Chun Li deck and then like a basic talky deck. And sure. out of that, I was able to make some really ridiculous kick deck that stood up to one of my buddy's decks. Who like he showed me the uh, the theory on it, and it's just like, oh, I can hit you for thirty damage in one round, and I'm just like, okay. I'm going to kill you first. <laughs> and, and, well, and Chun-Li can do that. Chun-Li is just that fast. Um, both in uh, Street Fighter and in USS, in my opinion. But then again, it's, I've been so long out of the game that I'm so dead wrong on that. So, um, either way, I mean, I'm just I'm coming back into this. So, it's just it's interesting to hear from somebody who's been in the game as long as you have that uh, knows what they're talking about and you know, can give me things to think about. Yeah, um, uh, if we'll talk, if, uh, talking a little bit about UFS history, um, the biggest, the biggest thing, um, that UFS has changed over the years, if you look in the past and you look at legacy decks and extended decks and cards that were printed in the, you know, the first sets and things like that, um, the strength was in the foundations, and the foundations were very, very strong. There were a lot more strong, in my opinion, there were more strong foundations than attacks. Uh-huh. And um, it really favored um, control formats a lot. And um, through the years, um, a lot of mill decks won, a lot of evil decks that will, uh, you know, reduce your control checks so you fail your turn have won. And... Um, Evil being, I believe, uh, almost guaranteed, um, Evil has won more championships than any symbol in UFS, and it's always been very strong. Um, but if you look at today's game, UFS, um, attacking is much more rewarded. Um, the the power is found in attacks in today's games. You see, um, you know, Jasco coming out with these ridiculous attacks, They print, you know, huge damage, great abilities, great utility, and they print these really great attacks. And, you know, I'm not saying the the foundations are weak, but, you know, if you look at the past and you look at Yoga Mastery and, um, you know, Curse Broken and uh, Whereabouts Unknown and Lost Memories, you look at those foundations and you don't see really anything like that on the power level in today's game, but you see a lot more strong attacks in today's game. And I think it's because Jasko wants to reward people for playing attacks. And you should be rewarded for playing attacks because it's a fighting game-esque card game. And and my teammate David Wagner, this past World Championships, he had great success with his Tira air deck, 
because he ran a lot of the, the old strong foundations and combined them with today's strong attack base. And not many people um, in the legacy had noticed how strong today's air attack base is in the legacy format. Just no one had really tried it until um, WAG did, and he had great success. He, he won a shaping ship off that. Which is amazing, and I really wish Dave would come back, and I miss that man dearly, despite the fact that I don't think I've ever said a single word to him. <laughs> yeah, I, Dave, Dave is a great guy, and um, there's definitely a chance of, uh, of actually Dave coming, coming back to play UFS a little bit more, um, more than, more than uh, Shu and Drew, um, just because they, they're tied up in you know, more personal life things than, oh, absolutely. than he is. But, um, you know, uh, Wack is a great guy and he's a great player. And I think um, even I even saw Drew just the other day and he, he's even like Drew is even building de- deck lists. Like he, he was telling me he was writing up a mature deck list just the other day. And like KOF, KOF lights a fire in everyone, uh, even, even, you know, my, uh, you know, the the OGs of Atlanta UFS that were like, oh, I don't know if we're going to play anymore, but they they get excited about their championship cards and they get excited about the King of Fighters set. And they're, you know, Drew's building decks and he was telling me about the deck and all this. And, you know, hopefully he'll get some cards and throw it together and we'll be able to play. So Yeah, I mean, I remember when we were at the, we were all at the Gen Con, well, maybe not all, me and you, were at the Gen Con, we, they announced KOF, and everybody was sitting there banging on the tables going, we want Andy. Yep, yeah, that was very exciting moment. <laughs> it was. Um, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. The, the announcement, I, I, I will definitely <laughs> say that, um, I, I talked to Jason, you know, every couple of weeks or so, sometimes I'm just saying hi, sometimes I might need a favor or a question. But um, I talk to Jason, you know, once every couple weeks usually, and he's he he gets he gets let's let's be honest he gets a lot of crap, and uh, you know the the community the UFS community um, we're you know, a harsh community yeah a very, very harsh, harsh community. very harsh community um, is quick is quick to complain about stuff and you know he takes everything with a grain of salt and he really tries his best and. I can definitely tell you he's really been trying his best with these KOF sets. He's doing things. Um, he's really trying to learn from some of the mistakes he had in the past, especially the printing problems with um, switching switching to an American printer instead of a Chinese printer, and I was really proud of him for that and excited about that. And uh, so there shouldn't be many printer issues and printing multiple sets, at least when it comes to KOF, printing multiple sets at one time. So there will be no issues on when a set is released because Jason has control of the cards. And when he says they go, he can send them on his own free will. So he's he's really trying to learn from some of the mistakes he's made in the past two years. And, of course, he is. I mean, the guy's never owned a card game before. Who has? You know, no, no one really. I mean, I couldn't tell you how, like, if I wanted to start a card game and print a set right now, I wouldn't know where to start. And, uh, you know, a lot of people give him a lot of flack for that, but I just want to say that um, Jasco Games is, and Jason Horonsky is doing a great job um, at – just pushing this game forward, getting Mega Man and Dolph Stalkers is huge. I have guys, I have friends that I showed them UFS and they played a while ago, my friend Brian Lee, and he said, wow, Mega Man's going to be in this game? That actually makes me want to play UFS again. And, like, that's the sort of thing I know Jason wants to hear. And he's doing a great job to do that and push it forward. Yes, and the fact that we have... Well, not release dates. We have release, I guess you can call them Outlooks, mm-hmm. already on Mega Man, which I believe is going to be debuting potentially at Gen Con. Potentially, yes, potentially. Um, and we have uh, Darkstalkers uh, somewhere on the horizon close to Halloween, which is very fitting. Very exciting. Um, not to mention Darkstalkers was one of the highest-selling sets 
the highest selling set. It was the highest. Wow. Um, both uh, Dark Stalkers and uh, Realms of Midnight. Um, I'm not sure. I. I'm not completely sure, but I, I had heard Jason had said the most sold set was Dark Stalkers. I don't know if it was both of them together or um, one or the other, but let's be honest, Dark Stalkers made the money. Oh, yes, Dark Stalkers definitely made the money. Well, now that you brought up KOF, and seeing as how um, I cannot wait for KOF, it is what is actually me. Brought me back into K- into UFS. I sat there and did like pretty much everybody else. Poo pooed on UFS and said, "Screw this! I'm gonna go play another card game." Played Van- playing Vanguard. Still playing Vanguard. Kalef has brought me back, much like many of the people. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on some of the KOF? Now the KOF is spoiled. Like, who are your top favorite characters? What cards do you think we'll be looking at? Okay, one thing I'm gonna do is. Uh look up the cards so I remember the names. I mean, um, I, I mean just to feel... I know what a lot of cards No, but uh but definitely. Um the 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 biggest characters I see, the the really strong character I see out of this set is Leona. Um she is an eight hand size character um to start with. Um I know a lot of people are excited about that. A lot of people aren't excited about that. But um she loses a card on defense um, at the end of her turn, so she's one less, so she's really a seven-hander on defense, which I think is a a very good balancing, uh, tactic for her, but she sees eight cards on offense on her turn, um, that looks like strong aggro to me, she has fire, um, and life, which got huge boosts in this set, huge boosts for aggro, and, um, a lot of people, don't know, a lot of people do know, um, A.J. Murray especially knows, um, the good symbol can be very aggressive. Oh, yes. And I've seen good decks that are very aggressive, and a lot of people, like, like, Righteousness is a five damage, five speed attack that gives the rest of your attacks plus one damage in itself. And can help you build. Helping aggro build while attacking you is very strong. Um, and that's what Righteousness does. Um, the biggest reason I think Leona is so strong is her attack Leona Blade. Um, I know there is a lot of hype over this card. Um, you know, it's a, it's an easy combo to get off. It's a high damage, low difficulty attack. You can give it stun three. You can ready your your cards. You can you can ready your cards that you committed for it. Like that's huge. That's huge. And in Leona, it can negate a responsibility, and it clear it discards from the card pool. So it makes your attacks easier to play and negates responsibilities. And responsibilities are what keeps aggro from killing people a lot of the time. You have when the moon comes over the mountain, that can that can really hurt people. You have reversals that can really hurt people. You have breaker that can really hurt people when they're playing aggro. And this card stops a lot of those issues. And it's something special to Leona that her character can have. She also has um, a foundation in the set. Um, I don't quite remember the name of it, but she has a foundation in the set that um, says your cards cannot, the difficulty of your cards cannot be altered. So what that does is stops breaker abilities and stops, like, cards like Triple Vada and Tempo. And those cards are really hard for aggro to deal with. If you get hit with a Curse of Corruption for Breaker 3 during your aggro kill turn, a lot of the time it doesn't become your kill turn anymore. Yeah, and Mercenary, that's the name of the card. Uh huh. Yeah, and that that is a really good card to help push aggro in the direction it needs to kill control decks. Um, while we're on the topic of aggro, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, the uh, I can't pronounce it at all, but the Mai Ultra Rare attack. Uh, you know, Shiranu Kamuchi no Mai. Um, Let me that that that, uh, that card is super strong. I mean, you can – it ignores progressive difficulty if it's your first attack. So 
you can play three attacks, play a ha- hand of foundations, still play it at a five difficulty, and use its ability to clear your carpool and draw a new hand. That is super strong for aggro decks, and it's only at the cost of one momentum. And what's even more ridiculous for me is it doesn't even have to deal damage. It's after the attack resolves. So you play the attack, and you clear your card pool and start a whole new turn of attacking on them. Like, that's huge. The card, oh, yeah. the card is a 5 diff for 7 damage. It's a high attack. Highs are very hard to block. It's a stun 1. In Mai, it's Desperation 3. I think Mai is one of the top characters, like, period right now, especially with the Bittner ban and the nerfs to um, Paralyzing Touch, which hurt the Sparrow's death a little bit. And in characters like Cassandra, that's the card has a plus three um, block modifier, which gives attacks plus three speed. So fire and life characters are looking really strong off those few cards I mentioned. Um, another life character that looks really strong to me is King. Um, uh, when I see her, I kind of see um, a deck like the Slice Kick deck from back in the day. Um, except Slice, you know, has, has gone away, but you can still make a life deck where you play, uh, easy to pass kick attacks. You play your easy to pass kick attacks and you play a lot of them and put a lot of cards in the card pool. And if you're, um, and if you're playing, uh, oh, what's the, what's the, uh, Leaping Snap Kick, if you're playing Leaping Snap Kick, you can put two cards in their card pool for just playing one card, and that's huge. And at the at the end of all your kicks, um, you drop your Zing and you drop your Genesis for no progressive difficulty, and that's huge, and it's really hard to block when you get a card in your card pool like that. And then King, she throws a bunch of damage um, on your last attack at the end of it. So that's really big. Um that's that's a lot of the aggro stuff that I've noticed. There's a King and Terry card that's going to be a really good staple card. They're both 1-5s with plus 3 block modifiers. Um, one of them said if there's no cards in your opponent's card pool, your attack gets plus 1 speed. One card says um, your attack gets plus 1 damage for the same thing. And that's going to be um, just really good staple card in those symbols. Um, it has, the symbols are all, um, the damage, the damage pump has all earth and good. The speed pump has all earth and order. Um, those are going to just be great. They're, they're one fives with blocks and they give free damage and speed. Um, and so basically almost all the time, your first attack is going to get plus one speed or plus one damage. And if they don't block, uh, that attack, then your next one's going to get, you know, plus speed or damage for free. So that is a really, really solid card. Um, to talk about more stuff, I've talked a lot about aggro. Um, I could talk a little bit about um, some of the control cards I see. Um, definitely, definitely some of the control cards I've noticed are um, uh, Ryuken, uh, Hoi Hoi Ryuken, which is the um, Yuri, uh, ultra rare attack. Um, that card is really strong on offense and defense. And a lot of value I see in cards is I'll look at a card and, um, and I'll say, wow, this card is good when you have to block with it and when you have to play it on your turn to kill people. So cards like that are very, very powerful and actually, um, uh, the, my action card will be, um, spoiled, I'm sure, within the next couple of weeks, but when designing my action card, when I won the Extended World Championship, I wanted a card that was good on offense and defense, um, because I value that so high, and this card, um, if it deals damage, you gain a vitality for each resource symbol on your character, um, if you're not playing Yuri, most of that, most of the time it's going to be three vitality. So it's, it's an attack that lets you gain three vitality. And if you're at maximum vitality, draw two cards. 
Um, it's a it's a it's a three check. It's six difficulty. It's a five speed high for seven damage, and it gets a chance to draw you two cards. That's amazing. It has a plus one block modifier. It has stats. It's it's range, so it blocks other range at zero. Um, it's it's stats on a card like I like I haven't seen in a long time. Um, now I'll get to its R ability, which gets to um, the control factor I see out of it. Um, its R ability. Um, in my opinion, is probably the best R printed on an attack in the Jasco era. Um, this card stops al- like almost everything in the meta. A lot of people don't notice how much discard interaction is there. And uh, it stops when the moon comes over the mountain, um, people bring cards back like that. That is huge. People do that all the time. It stops Vespera's ability. That is huge. People do that all the time. It stops all forms of discard pile recursion. There, that discard pile recursion is valued highly right now. People will play as many cards as they can to pick up cards from their discard pile and get them in their hand. And that's just huge. And not only that, um, a lot of, a lot of new players, I know the show is, you know, we like to direct it towards new players. Um, when you're learning UFS, the multiple mechanic gets to be a little confusing. And when a multiple happens, um, you use the multiple ability as enhanced. You discard the moment, you discard your momentum and send it to the discard pile, pick it up from play and place it face down into the card pool. So this attack stops multiple abilities. This attack stops multiple abilities it because it sends the card to the discard pile and then it comes into play. That's huge. Divine Tribulation is a ridiculous card in this format. It is amazing. A lot of people play that card in their decks and they win a lot of games off of it. And this is a card that can stop people from Divine Tribbing you by blocking with it. And that's huge. I mean, this is one of the cards that actually caused uh, Jolly and Gloomy to get ratted. So, I mean, you know, it's a really good card. I love it to death. Yes, it is a strong card. Um, just by first glance, I find it to be the strongest card in the set right now. Um, out of the set, I find it to be the strongest card, and it's really strong. Um, again, with a, with a little bit of control... Um, there's a good bit of attacks that um, say you can't play reversals to um, this attack. Um, a lot of people say that's directed towards the Sparrow, that's directed towards this, that's directed towards that. Um, let's just be honest. Reversals are very strong, um, whether it be a Vespera deck or a Luchin deck or a deck that, an all deck that plays Kaplow. Um, reversals are really strong, and... Um, this deck, these attacks kind of put a little bit of control on the ability to reversal. And a lot of times in games, I'll see players, Garrett Brett being one especially, um, he'll wait until he plays a lot of reversal decks, and you will play out an entire kill turn, and on your last attack, when your card pool is so filled, and you have, you know, seven vitality, he will block your last attack and reversal you with Kaplow, and people lose games off of it. And if you play this attack, if you play one of those attacks as your final attack, um, they're not going to get the chance to reversal you for game. And that is really, really a big deal. So I think that's really strong. Um, I know a lot of people are going to say, um, you know, this really excites me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Clark. Um, he's a five hand size character, which a lot of you know I love. Um, I won with four hand size. I played mainly in at the past worlds. I've played Skullman in multiple regional tournaments, and um, I pioneered the Skullman uh, King's Reverse DDT deck. And this is another great character. Um, He has draw ability on a five-hand size character, and a lot of the time that 
make or break five hand size characters. Um, being able to have some way to get card advantage back from that you lose for having a five hand size, that's huge. And it's really hard to aggro him down. If you try and play out a kill turn on him, he's going to draw a card, which can be a block, and he's going to commit one of your foundations. That is a big deal. And when he turns around on offense, when he turns around on offense, he's giving his attacks free damage pump for committing a foundation. And a lot of the time, that could be four damage on every attack. Or three, or three damage, you know, if he finds a way to draw cards. And fire and order definitely have draw power. So, um, he's a character that really excites me. Um, he's just a character that really excites me. I'm definitely gonna, uh, you know, probably get a build of him and try him out. He could be the character I play at Worlds. He might not be. Um, but I like it. I like him a lot. Um, another card that I think is, is really, really strong. And I think this card will be overlooked. Um, the Joe. Maybe, maybe not because, um, I've mentioned it, but there is a uncommon my attack. It is called, uh, Kacho Yusin. Kachosin. It's her fan throw attack. Kachosin, yes. The fan throw. Well, this attack is 4 speed, 4 damage, multiple 1. If it deals damage to multiple copies of the attack, gives plus 3 damage and plus 3 speed. Now, what hits me about this card is... It's, hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. It's 5... <laughs> <laughs> it's 5 difficulty to play. It is a 3 check. It has multiple 1. If you're playing my... You can play this attack and commit your Mai, and it makes this attack a 7-7. Seven, seven. If that hits and you multiple it, the next attack is a 7-7. Seven, seven. That's 14 damage and 14 speed coming off of one attack. That's really powerful. Divine Trib, multiple one, hits for 14 damage, and this card is one less difficulty and one better check. And that really excites me. I think that... Well, not to mention that, but if you're using Quick Exit on my, it makes the uh, multiple attack a 10-10. Exactly. It, in my, this card is dangerous. And I think that she was already such a strong character. And I feel like this just pushed her into top tier, possibly to become, you know, the best deck in the format. Definitely... Most likely one of the top four decks in the format. If you look at the California uh, Pro Tour circuit, three three my decks in their top eight, and that's before any of these cards are even printed. And that's in a format with Vespera and Paul Bittner. So, like, she's only gotten better with these bands and erratas. She's only getting better with this set. Um, she's going to be a strong character. You need to look out for my. Period. All right, now, as... And I'm totally okay with Mai being top tier, because as Joe well knows, Mai is one of my favorite UFS characters, and not for the... Or not UFS, King of Fighters, and not for the same reason that everybody else likes her. I like her because she's actually a solid character. Yes. <laughs> uh, also, uh, you know what? I'm not going to get into that one. Um, moving right along, Mai is awesome, and I'm okay with it. All right, Matt, I'm going to have to ask you this because I'm planning on asking for every interview. Uh huh. What do you think of the Joe card? What do I think of, <laughs> what do I think of Joe? Joe, Joe Tanello. Um, no, my Joe, please, if it was a Joe card, it would have had, uh, if it was my card, I think it would have had fire, earth, and all on it. And it would have been uh, searching for family on the character card. There you go. That's exciting. Well,. Here's what I think about Joe. Um, solid character. Very solid. 720, great symbols. Earth Earth and all are two of my favorite symbols. It excites me to see characters with those symbols. Um, he seems like a really strong Agros uh, character at first glance. Um, the thing about the, um, is, it, is it Team Fatal Fury? Is that, is that their team name? 
Yes, you know, Team Fatal Team, Fury. Team Fatal Fury. The thing about the guys from Team Fatal Fury is they discard cards from your opponent's card pool. And that force – and I feel like they can sort of be played around sometimes. Like, if you're afraid of being killed, you can try not to play cards or try not to block. But on the other hand, if you're blocking every one of those characters' attacks – they're clearing your their card pool. They're clearing your card pool for you, so it's easier to block. And um, yes, they do really strong things when they clear your card pool. And yes, I think they are solid characters. Um, but for me, I when I see a character having to be d- dependent on your main ability, um, your opponent doing something. Um, is a little weak. Is a little weak for me in a character. Um, All right. But I, I mean, I definitely, I definitely don't think he's bad or anything. I mean, he's a seven, he's a seven twenty with earth and all. Um, he he draws more cards after attack steal damage. I mean, he's he's going to be a great character. I mean, seven hand size all characters have have shown to be amazing in this format. Amazing, whether it be John Hare, Paul Bittner, um, or like Skullman, all decks like that. Um, the all wall, as some people like to call it, is very strong, and I think Joe will will take that deck and be able to do it very well. See, because I'm going to build my Joe off of Earth. Uh huh. Not to mention, I don't have to go to Gen Con anymore to try to win a character card since Joe comes out. <laughs> well, the big the big exciting thing about this set and um Earth is probably my favorite symbol in UFS. And um a lot of people didn't notice that before KOF there were no Earth seven hand size characters. There there was not one. Go to your search engines, go right now. In the current format, if we're playing with the cards released today, you cannot play a seven hand size earth character. And now this set comes out with three. You have King, you have Joe, and you have Iori. And it's it's gonna be different. It's it's a whole nother option of like to not it's 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 kind of mind blowing because for a symbol not to have one single seven hand size character, this opens up a whole new realm of what Earth can do seeing one more card a turn. And that could be dangerous. I mean, no one really knows because no one has seen it. I mean, the so, last time we had a seven hand size character with Earth was from KOF set four with Hanzo. Yep, and Leona was an eight hand size Earth character. Yes, yes, she was. So, um, yeah, it's it's been it's been a minute. To say the least, you know. Set three, Yori. So, yeah, so. now I'm going through to see how many actually seven hand size. So we got. <laughs> I have ADD. It's horrible. <laughs> uh, let me think. Uh, we got for the rest of us. Ken DJ. Mm-hmm. Uh, seven hand sizers. Does Promo Alex count? No, he doesn't have Earth. <laughs> uh, Kyoshiro. Iori, uh, mm-hmm. old school metrosexual Iori, you know, the one with the uh, open shirt. Uh-huh. Uh, and then it looks like it stops there and doesn't pick back up to Leona, so, yeah. There hasn't been many to begin with. No, there really hasn't. And not, and they definitely don't have the power to, com- those old ones definitely don't have the powers to compete with these four, to compete with these new ones. Right. And, uh, a couple other cards um, I'd like to mention. Um, one of them um, being Earring Bomb. Um, it's an action card that gives that stops Breaker and Reversal. Um, Breaker and Reversal are really solid control decks right now. Um, this card stops that at a 2-5 um, action with a plus one block. Um, and it also gives a damage pump um, ability. And speed, damage and speed, I'm sorry. So that is really, really powerful for aggro. Um, it gives them more damage and it stops their problems. 
not only what I found interesting is I don't know if I've ever seen an action card be ranged before, but in case you guys didn't know, look it up. Leona Blade is combo ranged, so you can what? play the form on Earring Bomb, which is an action, and then play your Leona Blade. So you don't have to play an attack into an attack. You can play this action into your Leona Blade, and that is super strong for Leona going off on an aggro turn. You have this card in here that's going to stop breaker and reversals while it's in your card pool just by discarding it. This card is giving your attacks damage and speed. It's a low difficulty. Then you play your Leona Blade in Leona, and then you can negate response abilities. I mean, this card is pushing aggro. This set is really, really pushing aggro, and a lot of the and a lot of the cards pushing these aggro is life and fire, and I find these symbols to be very strong in the upcoming sets. And fire is something I'm more than familiar with, as that is actually my go-to symbol. As Matt has seen, my the majority of my decks are often fire. In fact. I don't know. I don't think we played, but you got to see me play my Kyo deck. The fire Kyo deck. Yeah, yes. it was very strong. Very strong deck. Okay, Hello? so you all heard it. I have a strong deck. Yay! For yeah, Joe. It, it's, I'm still going to beat you. Kyo, Kyo is a very strong character. It's just that so promo Kyo is so good because he's playable while committed. Yes. I mean, he is tons of damage pumped. Tons and tons of damage pump. There was another card I wanted to mention. Oh, absolutely. We can keep I going have, for as long as you want. I had I, got the all name. <laughs> I had the name on it and I Is it an attack? It's a it's a foundation it's it's a it's uh we're gonna go back to control. All and right. it is a foundation. Oh, I have lost the name on it, but I'll talk about it while I try and find Who's it. Who's on it? Um it is an Andy Uncommon. A and suit? What, what it does is you can flip it to remove all keywords from an attack. Oh, Kapokan Training. Yes, Kapokan Training. Um, that is very strong, to say the least. Um, the closest card to this was Undisputed Ruler. Um, when playing Undisputed Ruler, you had to destroy it. Um, it had the same stats, and you had to destroy it to remove keywords off of it. This card you flip, so you get to keep it in your staging area as a blank foundation. That's really big, and I believe so if um, I'm not the best on the rules, but you remove keywords, I think, from the attack for the uh, – it just says remove keywords, so – I believe it's the first card in this uh, era of UFS we're in right now. I'll call it the Jasko era. In the Jasko era, to take throw off a keyword and the throw not to deal damage. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about throw and removing keyword, and there was really complicated rulings of damage step and how things work like this, but this card removes the throw keyword. So if I'm not mistaken, you can just block a throw and not take any damage with this card. So Interesting. Really, yeah. really, really solid. Doesn't it also uh, pretty much crap on reversal? Like as soon as they play it, you, your opponent plays an attack. Doesn't that make it not legal to play and bounce the card since it um, the reversal keyword? I, I'm not the person to ask for that. Um, I'm not completely sure, I'm going to be honest, because um, I think before, I think the reversal ends up getting played to begin with before you can even use the card. So I, I, I wouldn't quote me on this, but I don't believe you can keep people from playing reversals on you with that card. Um, it's something to definitely ask. If it does stop reversals, um, it may be the best foundation out of the set. Uh, that, and that's and that's what I have to say about that. Mm. So you heard it here, folks. So anything if, else you think worth mentioning? Um, 
Oh, I know we're kind of going on for a minute, but I will just say one quick thing. Um, Iori's guitar is um, pretty nuts, I guess you could say. See, I keep hearing this crap. Uh, well, not crap. It's very well founded about Clark's sunglasses, but no one seems to be talking about Iori's guitar. Um, well, Iori's guitar is really good to me. Um, it's just. I, I mean, damage reduction in in this format right now is it doesn't come around often. And just taking an attack to zero for commit, and I think it's two vitality loss. Yeah. Um, that's in your favor almost all of the time to lose two vitality to send an attack to zero. Um, no matter what attack, that is a big, a big deal. So I'll just say that there's so many more cards in this set though. And I'm sure I'll leave a few more cards for someone to talk on. I know a lot of people want to talk about day side and, um, uh, the stun King kicks and stuff like that, but you did mention Clark sunglasses. So, um, I will say something about that. Um, there is a lot of hype around this card and, uh, Alex Marco especially has really hyped this card up to me, and I'm I'm not sure about it. It's definitely solid, to say the least. Um, I I haven't really figured it out. Um, yes, it 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 commits. It can commit your opponent's foundations, and that's really, really solid. Um, I, I see it. I see it being strongest in um, high hand size characters, even though it's a Clark card. Um, because if a seven hander can outbuild you, and then commit your foundations when you're trying to, you know, attack them on your enhances, or if they can commit your foundations when they're trying to attack you and they're in a foundation advantage, that is very, very strong. And uh, I do see it being um, pretty strong on reversal and things like that. So um, definitely good. It's sort of uh, like a one-for-one stun card kind of thing. So I'll be interesting to see it played. I haven't I haven't play tested against it yet. So. All right. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Ed? Uh, I can't think of anything. I mean, I just, uh, what I've heard has just actually been helping me a lot. So I've been doing more listening than trying to uh, come up with questions, to be honest. Well, I mean, you know, we pretty much covered all the basics. I mean, we are there any other tips you want to impart on the, some of the new players that were getting into the game? Um, the, the new players I would get on into the game, um, I would say to any new player of this game, this game is... Um, it's not the easiest game to learn, um, but it's very, very fun. Um, it takes a little time to get used to, so don't get discouraged if, you know, you're losing every match or whatever, or you can't seem to build a good deck, because, like I said, I played this game for, um, like, almost eight years or something like that, so, and I didn't win a championship until I played this game for six years, so it's definitely really fun. It's definitely a game worth learning. What I love about UFS more than any other game, um, I feel like UFS rewards great deck building more than anything else, and you'll see just some people are great deck builders, and that's what uh, I know I've mentioned uh, Garrett a lot, but that's something that he is known for. He builds great decks. Um, a lot of people will have him build their decks for Gen Con. Um, Tim Keith, another great deck builder. Phil Birch. I mean, I could go on. Keenan Meadows, uh, Jeremy Ray, Andrew. L- I mean, all of the top players, all of the people that have won championships, most of them are good deck builders. And that's because great deck building is really rewarding in this game. And if you know the metagame and the cards that can be played and you know the cards that can stop them and you build your deck to do that, it's very rewarding 
and that and to be a good deck builder, it just takes time. It's trial and error. Um, and people talk net decking and all this. Go look at people's decks online. Like when Joe puts these decks on the website, look at them and study them and see why does he play this card. And I know Joe and Ed would be happy to tell you guys, and myself included, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me um, on the forums, ATL Piglet, send me, PM me. Um, but they, you can ask them and you see, oh, why does he play that? And then you might learn something new that you didn't even know. Um, and a bear lot in of- mind, asking me is probably not as good as idea as asking Matt. Because I don't win anything. <laughs> I just like to sit there and build. Hey, I've always man, been a I've better always... builder. I've always been a better builder than I have been a game player. You can ask anybody that. Hey man, I can build a deck just fine. I went four zero in Y Schwartz the other day at locals. So I'm just saying. I'm not trying to brag or nothing. I mean. Yeah, I mean. It, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that's. That's something that I love about this game. Um, you see a lot of other games, uh, Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh!, um, and you see top eights um, almost mirror deck lists um, across the board sometimes. And you'll see a very large amount of the time, depending on, you know, what's being played, four out of top eight be almost a mirror deck list. And in UFS... Um, with the help of diversity, um, you don't see that. And But not only diversity, you just, even if you see people playing the same character in almost the same deck, some people have these little niche cards that they get out of their playgroup, and they'll be like, oh, my playgroup plays a lot of this, so I'm going to run this card, and things like that. So you find these niche cards that you might have never even thought of, and sometimes those little niche cards win games, win tournaments, and win championships. Very yeah, good advice. Speaking of diversity, um, do you have any of thoughts on that? Uh, God, what am I thinking of? Uh, that little debate. thing that was debate. yeah, the little debate. Um, I actually was in a diversity debate on Skype, um, and Sam Waller was in the Skype call, and he mentioned it. And um, uh, Kevin Broberg uh, has a big opinion on diversity. Uh, I would say Kevin and Sam, from what I hear, um, they have the they have the most to say about the subject. Um, the biggest thing I could say about the subject is I, I do like diversity. Um, I played this game since set one, since Soul Calibur Street Fighter, the very first sets. And diversity has been a rule since the game began seven, seven, eight years ago. It's always been in effect. And I know a lot of people play the game competitively because they like the idea of diversity. But, and here's what I mentioned, and I think could be really cool for the game. At the price of basically adding an extra round of the tournament, um, if you have two characters that are the same in top eight, I think it would be really exciting to see a playoff between those two characters. If you have two Mai's in top eight, watching them play off in a mirror match is exciting. And the thing is, it's the people that have already qualified or been knocked out of the tournament. They're going to get to watch these rounds, and it's going to be really exciting. Everyone's there watching. It's four top eight. It's high-pressure situation. It's exciting, and I think it's good for the game. It's fun. Um, Sam had said, well, what happens if, like in California, three nice top eight? Well, at that point, we've done the diversity rule all time. Uh, so the lowest placing my at that point would unfortunately be diversified in the top two mys would play off. And that's how I would do it. I think a playoff system would be really exciting. Um, it would be really good for the game. And the only thing would be we add one more round. Everyone's like, oh, man, the UFS tournaments are so tight on time. How can we afford to do one more round? Tim Keefe said it best. 
If we start two hours late instead of five hours late, we have plenty of time to do one more round. <laughs> yeah, that it, sounds like snatch time to me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a UFS tournament if we don't start at least two to three hours late. So, but like in in another thing, Jason Jason knows that that like going back to how Jason's doing a good job. Jason knows that that's an issue, and I know for a fact that he's hiring tournament organizers and head judges and a judging team for this world to get rulings in order, to get tournaments started on time, to get deck lists and deck chicks taken care of. So, um, I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't really talk about that. I, I don't even completely know what they're being given, but they're a judging team. And there will be a judging team at Gen Con, and I think it's really good for the game. And if the, if I think that this judging team, the members that I know that are on it, which I don't think I can say, but the members that I know that are on it are very passionate about being a judge and really want what's best for the UFS community. So um, I think it's going to be really good for the game. And I think that we can get tournaments started on time. And if this becomes something people want to do, which I feel like it's kind of hard to argue a playoff system, like a, a mirror match playoff system, um, I just feel like a lot of people would enjoy seeing that. And a lot of people would like to have the chance to play off against the other character. And I, I, it would just it would just be hard for me to believe that someone wouldn't enjoy a, a playoff system in diversity. So that's how I feel about it. Uh, Joe, what do you think of that idea? Would you be against a playoff system like that? No, I wouldn't be against a playoff system because, you know, many times in fighting games that actually happens. I mean, we have Kyo going up against the Kusanagi clones. We have Ryu doing the internal struggle between Ryu and Dark Hado Ryu. We have those actually already in the fighting game, so why don't we have them now to begin with anyways? Right. I mean, that's just me from a video game perspective. I mean, a card game perspective, I honestly see no problem with the mirror match to let it us to let whoever has the better character proceed into the finals. Right. May, may, may the best man win. I yeah. mean, it, it comes back to the time with saying, may the best man win, and I think it would be really exciting. I mean, I can only imagine, like, you know, let's say Worlds happen this year. There's, there's a couple of Mai's in top eight. There's a couple of... Leon is in top eight. There's a couple. Let's say King. There's a couple of King in top eight. So there's all these three characters um, in top eight, and you're going to have three playoff matches right there before they announce the top eight, and you're going to have three playoffs right there and a whole tournament of, you know, 50, 60, 70 people there to watch those three matches. They're going to be surrounding the tables. They're going to be getting excited. They're going to be cheering on their teammates. They're going to be cheering on their friends. And it's going to be a really exciting experience, I feel like. But that, that's well, that's just how I feel. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, hearing all that, for sure, I need to get a hold of Jason and see about what I need to do to get on that team. It's not like I don't have the uh, experience. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I, um, I don't even know if if that was supposed to be public knowledge or anything. But I think Jason had had hinted it. So I'm sorry if I spoiled anything. But yeah, I know that there will be a, will be a judging team at Jim Con, and hopefully I didn't uh, get anyone in trouble or get myself in trouble for saying that. But I think a lot of people are going to be excited to hear that more than anything than someone to be upset. So, oh, awesome stuff. Uh, any, anything else, Joe? Any, uh, or Ed? Any, anything you might, uh, uh I, think I, can't think of, I can't think of much else except, oh, do you happen to have, you know, spare, you know, foil Terry Ogard lying around? Uh, I actually only have one. I possess one foil Terry Bogard. It, Fuck, right out loud. It will not be available, but... Um, the same Terry that is that promo um, is the Terry from the Chaos set that's an uncommon. So. Uh, I know. I told him. Wow, he broke up so bad just because of the cursing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's after yeah. the spoil. He's after the foil Terry. I told him if he wants these things, 
you got to come out to Gen Con. Yeah, yeah. Just let me, you know, pull the money out of my ass. <laughs> now, now. Uh, well, I'm just saying, man. Well, yeah, I mean, I know Gen Con is um, not everyone can, you know, afford to go and things like that. And uh, that's understandable, but I do like that Jason um, – tries to reward the people with cards like this and stuff for going to the big events, because um, I think people should be rewarded for going to the big events. I mean, if no one went to the big events, there wouldn't be much of a competitive UFS scene. But I will tell you something, Ed. Um, You can go to rochesterccg.com, and if you search for Terry, um, you can purchase promo Terry Bogards at $20 a piece. So. Oh. And incidentally, okay. now that we brought up Rochester, one of our upcoming interviews will be with the head of the Rochester door, Sean O'Brien. Oh, Sean O'Brien. Now we keep in touch. That's that's my boy right there. Love yes, Sean O'Brien. We actually, we had, and I think this is one of the odd th- stories. Is you remember when I was still running a tax of power in Dixon? Uh, yes. I'm yes, and you actually it. need to hear this story. This is a great thing. The guys from Rochester, New York, actually drove, what was it, like 14, 15 hours? Yeah, a ridiculous amount of time. Just for one day of UFS tournament, all the way from New York down to Nashville. And not like New York City, New York. This is Rochester, New York, which is up near Canada. Upstate New York. So. And I asked them what they were doing. They was like, oh, we all had the weekend off. <laughs> yeah, and like and, that but, sounds like. I mean, that that like stuff like that is really good for the community. Like, uh, you know, I wish I could travel more. Unfortunately, I can't. I travel when I can. Um, I'm a, I'm big into traveling around the southeast. I know Joe Joe and his group of guys will come to Atlanta. I'll take my guys up to Dixon, and like it, it it's something that we look forward to here in the southeast. Um, I know that. Uh, New York, they do their uh, New York State Empire Circuits, where they have tournaments all around New York and stuff like that. Um, but unfortunately, I I think the Empire Circuit and um, the SEC, which is a tournament um, series that I started um, and Joe helped me with, um, the, we call it the SEC, the Southeastern Championships, and it was a series of uh, three tournaments and We did one in Atlanta, uh, or two in Atlanta, and one up in Dixon, and that was a lot of fun. And I would suggest, um, you know, not everyone can travel, but um, traveling is easier, you know, when it's, you know, four, five, six hours close. So I would talk to, you know, your neighboring states or people that play in your state that, you know, might live far away, farther away from you. You know, people that aren't in your play group that are within, you know, a few hour radius, and you can really start some good tournaments. And if you talk to the right people, um, and you can talk to me because uh, I have a little bit of pull, but if you talk to the right people, you can, and you tell them you're doing a tournament, you can mosey your way on into some prize support for a pretty good price and some people are willing to help you out if you're you know if you're doing it for a tournament some people are willing to help you out that's all i'm saying and uh big shout out to sean at rochester ccg because when i had to run a tournament um he really helped me out on price support and yes i had to pay some money out of pocket and i know joe had to pay some money out of pocket to do his tournament but we all have to make sacrifices, you know, if we want the scene to be great. And I understand that not everyone has the ability to make sacrifices. But, you know, if you talk to your group and, um, you know, you're all willing to do a little bit, sometimes you can make something big out of it. And it's really good for the UFS community. Uh, being close with your neighboring playgroups, you know, when I say neighboring playgroups, I mean, you know, maybe the state over the guys – in New York and New England up there. Um, I would love to see something like this in California um, because I know that there are several playgroups up there, and I don't think that outside of PTCs, I don't think that 
from what I know of, I could be mistaken, but I don't think that those guys travel around that much. And I would love to hear about their tournaments and things like that. And, um, you know, M- Michigan and Ohio, like UFS House and, um, you know, Alexa and Jeremy's guys up there. Like, I would love to hear tournaments. That That's one of the uh, strongest play groups in the, in the nation right there. And I would love to hear about them playing – like UFS house and stuff like that. That's that's two classic strong play groups. So I hear that, man. Oh yeah. It's uh, it's good advice. It's actually something that I'm very familiar with. I come from uh, the fighting game community and such, and I'm no stranger to uh, seeing somebody make personal sacrifices. Sometimes you know of time, sometimes finances, mm-hmm. in order to make a tournament happen. I I learned all about that from who I believe to be one of the best tournament organizers of all time for for anything, really. So, uh, sure. you know, when I can do it, I do it. And, yeah. you know, I will be doing the same thing for UFS when the time comes. So, you know. Yeah, and, like, and the thing is, is, like, a lot of, like, in, it doesn't always have to be a money thing. People's time is a big deal, and if you want – um, a UFS group in your area, if your scene is kind of small. I know a, a lot of guys are trying to do demos and stuff right now, and I know Jason is happy to give you stuff to demo with and everything like that. And if you're willing to take, you know, an afternoon of your time and teach people how to play UFS and stuff like that, that's huge. And even when running the tournaments, um, I had to, unfortunately um, – one of our Southeastern Championship tournaments was scheduled on a huge release date of a new Magic set. Um, it was a huge release date. All these stores were like, they're like, there's no way we could do your tournament. I called five different stores um, in the area. There's like, oh, we, we, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it. So I ended up, um, I have a little like, um, like house. cabin area. Yeah, it's kind of like a small house. And I ended up, running pretty much running the tournament at my house and I had a lot of guys helping put their time in get everything prepared for that and that was a huge help to me so I mean that was that it was awesome it it turned out to be a great tournament and just people if people could you know come together um we can really push UFS in the right direction it's already going in the right direction And the more community support is great. And um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and thank Joe. um, You're more welcome. Um, Because doing things just like um, this interview we're doing right now with me and just the conversation we're having, this is huge because you guys are listening to this right now. And you guys are listening just me talk about UFS. And a lot of people, you know, like, you know, word starts to spread. You're hearing me talk about UFS, you want to go talk about UFS. Or you want to, you hear one of my opinions in this interview and you want to ask me, why do you think that? Or what do I think about this? And I would love to hear from you guys. Um, like I said, ATL Piglet on the Jasco forums, feel free to PM me. I know some people have me on Facebook. If you're a UFS community, uh, member, I would love to have you on Facebook and everything like that. So start talking up UFS. Um, worlds. World Championships, Gen Con, is coming up soon, like l- less than two months, I think about six weeks we're looking at here, um, six or seven weeks to Gen Con time, and I think there might be a couple more Pro Tours or Regionals in between that, so, you know, get get, get some hype up for UFS, get your play testing in, um, unfortunately, um, I don't think we're going to get to see Ed or Joe at Gen Con, but that shouldn't discourage anyone from going, I know that... Um, uh, Joe would love to be at Gen Con, but it turns out his uh, finances are going towards another trip. And I know that he would suggest going to Gen Con to anyone because it's a great time. Oh, absolutely. And I would, and I would suggest going to Gen Con and Nationals. And if you end up not being able to do that, go to your locals, go to your regional events, uh, you know, play UFS. That's the biggest thing because – um, Actually, I was going to say, uh, Matt, uh, Ed, Nationals may be something you could do, because Nationals is over at Vegas. Um, I'm actually looking into it. I have a friend out there at Vegas that can probably help me out. 
and uh, you know I'm looking at hopefully before nationals having my team ready to go. And uh, Matt, I'm sorry, but if we show up, we're we're bopping you and your guys out of teams. <laughs> I would. I'm, I'm just I, saying, I would, Wichita's coming hard. I would definitely be up for the challenge, man. I would, and I love to hear that. And I love I love smack talk, and that's something the UFS community loves to smack talk. Uh, just like I said about Garrett, Garrett loves to smack talk Atlanta and me and Birch. Birch and I love to smack talk. And I think that that's good. Some people, some people think like, oh, they're kind of being rude and all this, but not, but not really. Cause we're all friends and we're doing it in good fun and yeah. it, it gets people talking. Like that's the thing, you know, you get people excited about, about something and UFS is something good to get excited about. Yeah, I mean, yeah. very well, few consider... times does it get bad. And honestly, I can't yeah. – I think there's only like one time it got bad. The the, the best time it, it it got, quote, unquote, bad is drunk Matt Coles asking Marco how many times he beat him, and his answer was every time. So that, <laughs> that was the funniest thing ever. Well, I was talking about, like, the scuba dude incident's bad. Like, crap, oh. where we were going to – Get somebody bad. Well, yeah. I'm uh, fortunate. I'm gonna say fortunately, I didn't travel around with Scuba Dude. A lot of my teammates did, and stuff like that, and had the pleasure of meeting him, if you will. But I, I did not have that pleasure. And I have tainted this so. whole podcast by bringing him up. Yep. Yep. No. Now everyone's just just exited out their browsers, and it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but no. In all seriousness, though, the trash talk in in games. I mean, it's 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 good for you. It's it's growth as long as you know where the line is. And to be honest, I mean, consider where so many UFS players came from. I mean, I know I'm actually coming from the fighting in community, and it's just like yeah. uh, you know, I'm just like it, it. And it's it's very much the same way in the Vanguard community. I mean, we're just so much like there's so much smack talk, so much of this and that. And, you know, you can always tell, like, the difference between when somebody's just smack-talking for the sake of smack-talking or, you know, when it's in good fun. And then there's the dude who comes in and smack-talks because he thinks he's hot shit and then gets bopped, and it's just like, GG, bye-bye. See you later. So, I mean, I, I'm really I'm really seeing more and more as I'm getting into UFS that it's really not the case. That oh, well, you like haven't seen smack-talk and bring up assault until we interview Scott Gaines. Oh, please interview Scott. Oh, you uh, why do I know to. that name? Why do I know that name? Uh, Scott uh, uh, dabbles in the fighting game community. I know that name. Maybe, maybe Scott Gaines. Scott Gaines UFS. Uh, he, runs I'm the other, up on. he runs the other UFS store. He's actually huh. somebody who I play with a lot of times. And unfortunately, I have to sit there and play against his Fire of Aspera deck. Every single bloody time, or promo Ukio every single bloody time. And he's known as Scott Scott Games Games. Yes. For those of you that don't know. Um, and also known as the Godfather of Orange of Card, Seed. Blue Card. <laughs> but um, Joe, I think I'm gonna have to run. So if you want to close out the show, and uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to give a couple shout outs and stuff. No, like absolutely, that. by all Go means. For us. Um, biggest, biggest shout out, you know, want to give a shout out to Jason and his, uh, you know, family and, you know, I know his brothers and girlfriend and he has tons of people working for him. The Jasco game staff, they're doing a great job. Um, they're just doing a great job with UFS right now. It's a good time to get into UFS. It's a very exciting time in UFS. Big shout out to them. Um, I want to give a big shout-out to Sean O'Brien and his store, Rochester CCG. Um, Sean took a risk in starting this business. Um, he took a risk in starting this business to sell uh, boxes and product and singles and play mats and stuff like that. And he took a risk for the UFS community because um, there was a time when cool stuff wasn't really offering um, – many singles anymore so there was no singles market so he took his own money and he took a risk to be an entrepreneur and he did it for the ufs community so um i really support him and his store i pre-ordered my boxes from him and his store 
and he's a great guy. And it's the UFS community helping the UFS community if you buy from Sean O'Brien, and that's that's what I'm going to say there. Um, I want to give a big shout out to um, to Atlanta UFS. Um, I love I love my guys. I love the OGs. I love uh, Shoemaker and uh, Wagner and Drew Maffei and my young guns Matt Maffei, uh, Ben Lambright, uh, Alex Marco, and Keenan Meadows. Um, we we can't wait to see everyone at Gen Con and things like that. We can't wait to you know spice things up a bit with some uh, decks we've been working on and some playtesting we've been doing and things like that. Um, I want to give a big shout out to uh, Joe for having me on to the interview and Ed for uh, having me on as well. Um, Cheers. Please please go check out um, Joe's content. It's it's amazing. Uh, he does great decks. He does great analysis of his decks. Um, I know that I might be the first person that has done this interview, but I find these interviews to be very exciting. I'll definitely be listening. I'll even listen to this one again just to listen to myself. <laughs> and I'll definitely, I'll definitely be listening to the other ones he makes. Um, people supporting UFS media um, is really big to get the community bigger, and that's something I really want to push, and that's something I've been trying to push for the past year. Um, if you have any skills, I don't even have skills um, in making videos or anything, and I tried my best to do it. So just like we were talking about earlier, um, commit a little time. If you If you would like to make videos or write articles or you have any skills like that, I would love to read people's articles about things in the game or player profiles or things like that. And I'd love to watch videos about the game or recording your matches or whatever you want to do. Put your UFS content out there. I will be watching it for sure. So um, those are my shout outs, uh, Joe. So I don't know, whatever you do, it's the first time being on the show. So, right, so I'm going to hand it over to you. We thank uh, Matt for joining us in Total Justice Gaming. As always, yeah, I time. will be back next week on my YouTube page, which I really got to change the name over to Total Justice as opposed to Jokes Nello. But at that point for our next UFS deck, we'll be looking at Mr. Karate. Ooh, um, oh, dear. Yes, it's uh, Death Mr. Karate. Uh, I believe it's ranged, Death Mr. Karate. What? So Takuma's going to be sitting there throwing out some bullets at people. And Ed, do your thing. Oh, my thing. Well, um, of course, check out uh, Henshin Justice Unlimited for all my articles on PR, Power Rangers ACG. Keep, your, uh, keep everything tuned to Total Justice Gaming for more on Card by Vanguard and for UFS. And, of course, check out the Team 316 blog at team316.blogspot.com for all of your coverage on Wichita Vanguard, which is really the only Vanguard that matters. Um, of course, check us out at uh, – check me out at Anime Festival Wichita. I will be uh, giving out – I actually just today got uh, a committal from Jason that they will be sending me a pretty sweet care package for uh, Anime Festival Wichita. So if you make it out, just hit me up, and I will give you some free stuff. And we'll throw down some UFS, whatever you want to do. Uh, got a Card Fly Vanguard tournament coming up that day that's officially, uh, actually officially sponsored by Bushy Road. Also sponsored by Ultra Pro and by a store here in town. And, of course, we have the pre-release coming up, which I haven't fully announced yet. But other than that, um, for everybody at Total Justice Gaming, Joe, uh, Rider Kick, and Matt Turner, and of course I'm Edward the DJ Clax. Thank you for coming in and uh, listening to these crazy, crazy podcasts today. I'm sorry I went silent for so long. I had things I had to do. But uh, tune in next time who, where we will have uh, – who? what do we have going next time? Uh, next time is just the general gab, and I will be trying to do a vlog interview with Sean O'Brien. Oh, yes, that should be fun, and hopefully I'll have a webcam set up by then and I can join you. And I won't have a 64-bit install of Linux that will crash on me. And hopefully so. you'll just have Windows. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working <laughs> on it. All right, Matt, thank you again for joining us, man. It was a great time. Thank you, guys, for yes, having Yes, thanks me. so much, Matt. All right, once more, for Total Justice Gaming, I'm Edward the DJ Clax. 
with Joe Tonello, Ryder Cake, and Matt Turner. Say thank you for listening, and we hope to see you next time. Have a great day.